Well, thank you all for being here. This is my first time talking to EGADS. I had no idea there were so many of you. I thought it was going to be a small room with just 10 people in it. Uh, so this is a huge surprise. And thank you even more for staying without pizza. That's like real commitment. And that is a training you'll need to succeed in a career of game development. You will always be waiting for the pizza to arrive. <laughs> Um, I also appreciate your president's honesty in telling you that the pizza wasn't here yet. That's a, that's a good person right there. For my talk today, I wanted to talk to you because uh, when I was your age, I would sometimes go to talks like this, and I don't know what I expected from them, what I was hoping to get from them, so I want to try to speak to you as honestly as I can. Uh, but before I get into game development, I want to talk about something weird because you're in college and I hope you enjoy weird things. But this is a picture, or two pictures, of the same man. His name is Teching Hise. Uh, he also goes by the name Sam. And he's a Taiwanese performance artist who was active during the 20th century for several decades. Uh, he became known, his thing was, doing these really long performance art pieces where he would do these interesting things. Like he tied an eight foot rope between himself and a female performance artist and they lived that way for a year, vowing to never physically touch or interact with each other. So these two people spent an entire year next to each other. One of them would go into the bathroom, the other would, on their rope, be around the hall uh, while all this is happening. But he did stuff like this. He would spend a year uh, living inside a prison, basically, like living inside a cage. He spent a year living under bridges outside uh, and then refused to cross thresholds and sort of enter indoors. So I'm not sure, I know there's a lot of computer science majors here, uh, but however you might feel about modern art, whether it's bullshit or whether it's interesting, uh, I choose to sometimes think it's interesting because the way he approached what he wanted to do, he called them existential provocations, which is, yeah. Uh, but his most famous piece was this one, where uh, it was called One Year, 1980 to 1981, uh, better colloquially known as the time clock piece. And in this piece, he would get up dressed in this little outfit, this little like worker's outfit. It had his name on it. Um, he wore shoes. And there was this time clock, which is this old uh, fangled thing that people used to use in factories and restaurants and retail shops where you'd have a card and you'd punch it and you'd be like, all right, I clocked in. Now I'm going to clock out. And for a year, he woke up on the hour, every hour, and punched the time clock. For a year, he never slept more than 50 minutes at a time. I promise all this will make a point soon, probably at the end of the hour, but uh, his work, uh, when he described it, um, was sort of an exercise in both persistence and pathos. He was incredibly dedicated to his craft. He did multiple uh, exhibits, things like this. But as you can notice, one of these things is not like the other in terms of these punch cards, and that there were cases where he messed up and he didn't actually clock in on the hour every hour on the right most. So something interesting kind of happened in the overall piece is that failure became a part of the work. And that failure was the part of the work ultimately when it was finished. It was part of the piece, the art, and the intention. He did a lot of this by himself, sort of off on his own. When he was a modern artist, uh, the art community wasn't paying attention to him. No one really like, cared about him, knew his name, did anything. But he did all of this, and now he's showing up in modern art galleries and whatnot. All of his work essentially became this sort of documentation of persistence, of sort of clocking in, checking in. You can look at this and they were sort of think, my gosh, what an exercise in misery or self-punishment. But the truth is, is that he never actually approached any of this with the idea that punishment is this great thing. He just sometimes describe it as a little damage can be good for the soul. And he ultimately saw a lot of this work as something earnest and that he was constantly showing up and being persisting throughout the course of his career. So now that I've introduced you to this incredibly weird thing, I want to ask you all a question is, do you have a metaphor for life yet? Do you have an understanding or a thought process about what life is supposed to be, about who you are and how you connect to others, how you exist in the world, or what the world really is. For him, life was a performance, or life is a performance. 
and that certain conditions exist for certain types of people. And for some reason, he could spend a year, say, being homeless, and some people might call it art, while we're in Austin. There are a lot of uh, unhoused people that just live their lives normally. He was calling attention to sort of existential questions about what we do and who we are. You might have heard this phrase before, life is a play with no rehearsal, which was originally coined by Charlie Chaplin and has mutated throughout the years and taken on this shorter, more colloquialized meaning. Um, for some, remember this is a talk about game development, for the Buddhists, life is suffering, which to them is the first truth before many other truths are revealed to you. That's kind of a dark thought, and it's an interesting way to start. Welcome to your kickoff, y'all. <laughs> um, and I'm going to share my metaphor for life uh, with you all in just a bit. But before that, I want to say I am going to be sin sincere with you. Um, I kind of lied when I started this, when people come to these talks. When I came to talks like this, when I, when I was your age, I had no idea that the world was going to change so much. I had no idea that the world was going to keep changing. And for much of it, I didn't realize that the world would start to feel so dark in a lot of different respects in terms of things that were happening and things that happened around the world. So I don't think it does a, disser I don't think it does a service to you to give you a feel-good presentation. I promise there will be parts that feel good. Um, but I just want to be upfront with you about that because especially if you are considering game development, I had no idea what I was doing when I started. And as a result, I made mistakes and encountered obstacles I never thought that I would actually face. But the truth is, I'm still standing here. I'm getting to do exactly what I want to be doing in games. So I'm hoping that when I share this with you, it can help you when you decide how you want to make choices. And I know it's really hard being sincere around game developers because we love like memes and irony and like talking shit and <laughs> all that. So this is going to be weird for me too, if it's weird for you. But this is my metaphor for life, is that life is but a game. Uh, this is a, st uh, a gift from Breath of the Wild. If you haven't played it, maybe you should. It's like the best game of <laughs> all time. And more on this will come later, but this is, Maybe if you've made a game before, you care about games. You might agree with this, you might have a different metaphor, but bear with me that games are these wondrous things that create joy and open up and show possibilities for everyone. Uh, games are also these things that create order and provide comfort and sort of show everyone everything has a place. Games can also be these incredibly intense things, this sort of uh, fetishizations, this sort of grotesque beauty of violence and skill and punishment. Uh, I do not play Elder Ring. I suck at it. <laughs> and then there are these other weird games like Magic the Gathering that create rules and then all the gameplay comes from breaking them. So games in a way are life made playable. You might not have noticed this yet or whatnot, but there's a lot of things that are happening around you and whatnot that kind of resemble a game. There are a lot of mechanics of what you can get by in the world. You can use money, you can use emotions, you could be beautiful, you could be a really great speaker, you could be smart. You could also just be super dumb. There's like paths forward for people like that too. Um, there are systems that happen, relationships and identities, there's companies, religions, there's social media is one of the biggest systems ruling us right now. And then there are all these things, these rules that dictate how we can interact with each other or what's the right way to interact with one another. This is an incomplete list. I wrote this in a fugue state at like 1 a.m. Uh, so if you think you should add things to this or complicate it or simplify it, by all means, but this is just a very simple way of looking at things. And as you sort of navigate the world, I want you to know that you have a choice about how you navigate it all, even if you might fe believe that you don't. There's this really good movie. I'm not sure if anyone's seen this yet, but <laughs> called Everything Everywhere All at Once. And this is perhaps the best movie both about our times and for our times. And without spoilers, it is about a woman who gains the ability to connect to all of the different selves she could have been if she had made a different choice in her life. 
There's nothing more like a game like that. Like all these discrete choices that happen that create these sort of linear timelines of what success could have been, um, what, she, what skills she could have gained. And it's a pretty amazing movie. It's very profound and stupid at the same time. It's really interesting like that. And the person in front of you is a summary of choices. So I'm going to share some of mine and what my playthrough has been so far in life. Uh, you're right now getting to meet me. This is what I call endings and beginnings. I got married. My husband's were over there in the back on the camera. Um, you can s probably make out that really jacked guy in the corner was the 3D animator on uh, Vessels. <laughs> He's a ridiculous human being. Uh, he got drunk and then sp poured <laughs> a drink on me at the end of the night uh, and then like shuffled away. <laughs> uh, he's a great person. One of the reasons I'm up here is I work in indie games. I'm a director and a writer and basically whatever is required of me at the time until I can get someone who's better at it to do it. Uh, I've made a bunch of games over the years. Uh, I made a game called Loke Animals. I did a game jam here at UT back in 2015 and I won. It was called Sky Cash Money Dive Live where you s skydive for cash without a parachute. Um, it had a Shiba Inu host and two little pugs that uh, were your UI buttons. Their name were Valerie and Bones. And the most recent game that I've made is called Vessels here in the bottom right corner. You might notice that there's a big tonal shift from the top right to the bottom, la <laughs> bottom right. <laughs> I also have a parallel life in human insights. I work as an associate director at a company called Known, which is a giant marketing agency. They do make ads, they do data science, they do focus groups. I'm on the part of the focus group side. So part of my job is, weirdly enough, just talking to people and asking them questions about their lives, the things they do. I've done work in uh, AR for giant tech companies. I just got done doing a big project about home robotics. So I've seen what's coming. <laughs> um, even things as simple as how do you use your smartphone? Do you use the front camera or the back camera? Do people still use Snapchat? <laughs> questions like that. Um, I also have a mission which is maybe weird, but I'm in indie and we can be pretentious like that. Uh, but basically it's to create experiences that encourage people to seek and create greater, greater meaning in their real lives. I think there are ways that you can play games where the games start playing you. And I'd be nice if we stayed in control. Uh, the big reason I'm up here is because I made this game called Vessels. It's a two to three hour narrative adventure game uh, where you're on a spaceship you're quarantined in an airlock. Uh, there are three people on the other side of the glass door that think there's something wrong with you, and they're right, because there is something wrong with you, and you have been possessed by this, not possessed, but touched by this strange entity that gives you the power to reverse time and possess people. I'll talk a bit more about that, but uh, turns out uh, I didn't think the game was good, and then people started saying, telling me that it was good. Uh, review on Steam, it got almost everything right. Suspenseful story, relatable psychology of characters, no bullshit dialogues, good direction, perfect example of how to catch a player's interest by the balls right in the first scene. Yeah. <laughs> really, uh, start in, if, if the only writing advice I give to you now is start in the middle. Like, never start your scene with a hello. Fun, time-looping mechanics and corresponding puzzles. It's damn good sci-fi thriller and horror with a bigger scope and careful redaction. This team could do something great. We got reviews from buried treasure that called it a fascinating game. Uh, one with more, more, one that no matter how you play, forcing you into some ugly situations. And a smart idea. And we won an IGF award. If you're not familiar with the IGF, the IGF is uh, sort of like, I consider it both that and the Game Developers Choice Awards is the awards if you work in games to really aspire for, because those are the awards that are decided by other game developers. So we won this award, it was great. Uh, just for context of who we were up against when we won this award, we won against Dorf Romantique, which just came out on Switch like a week or two ago. We went, were up against great games. And Symphonia, you can tell from the laurels that were next to them, this is the only award ceremony that we submitted to, and, the only, and we won. Uh, so that was pretty nice. Uh, just to stay humble, one of the chats in the Twitch was, never heard of it, but pog for them. <laughs> um, which I just love. <laughs> uh, 
so if anything, maybe that conveys some authority to you. Like, I guess I won an award a lot of people want to win, and I did want to win it, to be honest. And here I'm going to talk to you about how maybe you could potentially win this award someday. But most importantly, what I hope is how you approach maybe game development, how you work with teams, and how you choose to live. All right, here's the tutorial uh, of the game. So I, this is me in college graduating. I was a, I caused a lot of mischief. Um, when I was your age, I didn't know what I wanted. I just did whatever I wanted. Uh, in high school, I wrote a play that satirized all of the different teachers at our school, and my favorite teacher came up to me with a sense of surprise afterwards and was like, that was good. Uh, I majored in psychology, uh, and because I watched a movie, Silence of the Lambs, it never occurred to me that I could like major in film or communications or anything like that. I befriended squirrels on the campus. I went to Israel for study abroad. I was there for six months in the desert, which I do not recommend, uh, and I'm not Jewish or Christian or Muslim at all. I just kind of wanted to see what the fuss was about. I, in, at my first advisor meeting, when I met my advisor, he taught uh, music and singing. And instead of helping me with my course load, he, we did a voice lesson. And he signed me up for choir. And I started performing in choir and doing uh, musical theater uh, and started doing a lot more playwriting. I love Beyonce, so I learned the single ladies dance. And if I was ever low on uh, money in Monopoly, I would dance for my rent. So it was a good time. I had my main quest line. It was psychology. I maxed out on all the different classes I could take. I did side quests and student activities, playwriting, media studies, and playing video games. And I invested my skill points accordingly. I put everything in a psych and grades, some in theater, a, a bit in leadership. Uh, you can ignore the social and romantic life in computer science. There's nothing to see there. Uh, I will say I tried taking one computer science class before I ever knew I wanted to work in games. And uh, it defeated me within the first session. Uh, and I dropped from that. And I was doing everything I wanted to do. My life was like pretty cool. Uh, I, my senior year, did a study on the effects of music in Twilight Princess. Uh, and ultimately co-authored a study that I published with one of my professors. I got to present it at this conference back at Meaningful Play, uh, which was a while back, but I got to see some of like, the big wigs of the games industry, like Ian Bogost, and um, it was just a crazy time. I presented a poster there, and then something weird happened where a developer came up to me while I was presenting the poster, and he asked me, so what do I do with this? I explained it to him, but then I realized that you can sort of pursue a life that's very academic and whatnot, but all of the work that I would have done in that wouldn't have gone into the hands or been a, gone across the eyeballs of the people who needed it most, and those were the people making games. So something started to feel wrong about the path that I had set out for myself. I hope it's OK that I'm talking about feelings with you all. <laughs> uh, and I realized that there's a difference between doing what you want and knowing what you want. And that you can spend a life just doing what you want, but that doesn't necessarily ladder up into some greater knowledge unless you stop. While I was at that conference, I saw a talk by this guy named Drew Davidson. He did a semiotic analysis of this classic indie game that was part of the sort of the indie revolution called World of Goo. It's still a pretty great game. Uh, and it was the most fascinating thing I saw there because he basically talked about how games construct meaning through art, through narrative, through mechanics. Uh, and that lodged itself in my brain as I was having an existential crisis about what to do after I graduate. And then this guy, who was a theater professor that sometimes oversaw plays that I was writing at the time, gave me the mandatory advice that anyone interested in majoring in theater should get, which is that it's unlikely you will do what you study as a career. This might be, that's probably not true for computer science people, but it's very true for theater people. Um, if you're in theater, not everyone's going to end up on Broadway. Not everyone's going to end up in a Marvel movie. Um, but it was oddly freeing in a way to recognize that the thing that you committed so much time to didn't necessarily need to bind you into that life. So I had a bunch of choices. I had already crossed one out. I had applied to Carnegie Mellon where that Drew Davidson guy was, or I'd go to NYU as my safety. And then I said, fuck it, and just went to New York and dropped out of NYU immediately. As you can tell from this, <laughs> I also did this in 2009 during the Great Recession. So I was just like, <laughs> no holds barred, let's do this. 
I started working in Human Insights and uh, had some really interesting interactions. Part of my uh, company's time, they were just really good at like fan research and community research. So I did some pr crazy studies for like South Park. Uh, I got to go to Comic Con and interview all these like South Park fans about what they loved about South Park because their team, for some reason, the age of people who love South Park, the median age has always been 22 for over like two decades. <laughs> if you want to find out, we can ask, you can ask me about that later. I, the study I'm most proud of that I did like win an award for was this study uh, where we were studying Spongebob. Uh, I don't know if anyone's a fan of Spongebob or whatnot. Yeah, I am. But I love Spongebob. Anyways, um, it was really interesting because this study, uh, I would interview a five-year-old and ask them, what do you like about Spongebob? And they would be like, he's yellow and square and he makes Krabby Patties. And then they would get distracted and run out of the room. <laughs> And then I would turn to the dad that was in the room and I asked him, well, what do you like about watching Spongebob? And he was like, Spongebob loves what he does and he shows up to work every day, even though Mr. Krabs doesn't pay him. <laughs> and it was this moment where I realized that the best media always has something to say. And sometimes it has something to say for just a kid. Spongebob works for kids, but also SpongeBob ended up working for adults and people who in different stages of their lives because it still had something to say. Ultimately, the message of SpongeBob that we won an award for was persistent positivity. That no matter what happens to SpongeBob, SpongeBob always gets back up and SpongeBob always tries to bring light into any room he's in. As much as all that good stuff was happening, this will become a trend, something felt wrong. I was realizing I spent all this time studying all these great things that other people created and realizing that I, what I still wanted to do was make them. I went to a different conference and this good dude showed up again <laughs> uh, and gave a semiotic analysis of Minecraft and I was at 1 a.m. in a hotel room working on a presentation for the CEO of my company thinking about what the hell am I doing? Like, this dude keeps showing up. I want, I love games, I wanna make games. Like, why am I not doing that? So, uh, I basically decided I was gonna go to Carnegie Mellon. I quit my job, I moved back home, and very luckily, I did get into Carnegie Mellon, uh, and the next phase of my life began, which were the trials, when I actually went. I went to grad school in games. I should be honest, I wanna just tell you all, you're very lucky to have each other right now, because at my undergrad, Games were not the thing that they were. There was no community like this for everyone else around you. I had to go to another school to get something of this experience. When I was in undergrad, things like this did not exist. So that's something in th that's different between our generations. Uh, this is the school. It's a five-story like silver thing built in the ruins of where the old steel mills of Pittsburgh used to be. I didn't realize this, but the school that I went to, uh, the program was created by Randy Pausch, who did the last lecture. If you've ever watched that, it's a very inspirational talk. I didn't know about any of that when I signed up for the school. I showed up. Uh, I, don't, I still don't know how I ended up there in some ways. Um, regardless of that, something finally felt right. Working in games was pr this program, especially that first semester, was one of the most amazing experiences I've had. Uh, it's like creative, great creativity being like sort of unlocked in you. I created all these different prototypes in the world. I've some, I created some of the things that I still love the most. I made a game about a cat and a dolphin who become unlikely friends. Uh, this thing on the bottom right is a music video I made that's weirdly taught in Canadian college classrooms now. It went like low-key viral. <laughs> um, uh, and it was awesome. Like working in games, I went to the San Antonio Children's Museum and created uh, a creativity exhibit for the kids there. It was a time where you could just play like JS Joust with each other and you were surrounded constantly by your people. This is something I think you already know about. It was basically a time when you could, you were reaching for another slice of pizza while you already had pizza in your mouth, as my friend Danny here uh, <laughs> did. She gave me permission to share this photo. She works at Naughty Dog now, um, <laughs> and she told me that the only advice that she can give you is that the key to getting into game development is to enjoy muscle pizza. <laughs> She's joking. She's Anyways, I, while I was here, I met the people I wanted to play this game with. Uh, this is a group of some people who are still my best friends. Some of them are leads at the 
uh, studios that they work at now. Uh, like I said, Danny on the right, she works at Naughty Dog. In the middle is Erica, who's my best friend. She was our maiden of honor at our wedding. Uh, she did the sound effects for Enter the Gungeon and Katana Zero. So uh, basically, I work around a lot of cool people. And then we worked on Locanimals together. So about a year or so before Pokemon Go was released, we made a location-based creature collection game where you could go to different locations, check in, and collect and battle all these different little creatures. I didn't know what the hell I was doing. I was just, we were just, it was a crazy time to be stupid. Like I made a manatee locanimal up in the top right named Manatees. Uh, <laughs> uh, it, it, but it was ultimately a fun time. It was a time that we wanted to take to go to startup. That was the fantasy at the time for every indie, was to be the next Jonathan Blow. It was to be the next World of Goot, uh, Kyle Gray. Um, we had this cute, even had this cute guy. We had all these business plans and whatnot. We were working with the Pittsburgh Penguins at one point to create a local animal that was based on one of their creature, uh, their mascot. Ultimately, like being in school right now is probably one of the best times of your life, where Everything will seem possible to you, and everything can be possible to you. Something felt wrong. I knew what I wanted, but I wasn't prepared for what I wanted or the obstacles. When I came up in game development, it was a very different time. Well, I wouldn't say different, just uh, it was in the process of change. Uh, at our program, we did this thing where we anonymously ranked each other. So you would get a sheet after every project, every game you made, and then people would rank you in your program on a bunch of different factors. For me, I was ranked at the top for leadership and creativity, and I was only in the top third for easy to work with. So there are some rude awakenings when people can sort of tell you what they think of you later on. When I was working in games, a lot of my non-assignments uh, never got started, kept falling apart, or just weren't good. I've watched, gone to many game jams, um, if you don't finish your game, don't beat yourself up over it. I'm just going to tell you that now. Or if it's not as good as you want it to be, just try to get through it and have fun. Meanwhile, I was watching as classmates and friends basically ascended. If you've ever seen uh, an indie sort of go viral overnight, uh, I got to see that with Albert Shea on Superliminal. If you've played that, uh, it's called Museum of Simulation Technology at one point. Um, watching my classmates field calls from Polygon and Rock, Paper, Shotgun uh, and get to the front page of Reddit. I have other friends, again, that have worked on Enter the Gungeon that are part of that team. They all live here in Austin, too, and sort of watching the sort of greatness start to unfold. As I was failing, I had an idea for a game about a woman trapped in an airlock and a man on the other side of the door. And I wrote a terrible twine about it and trying to write like it was a game. And everyone who played it said it didn't feel like me. And so I didn't do anything with it or the idea. Then the sort of the biggest things that happened, uh, if, you can, if you ever can in your career, it'd be amazing to go to GDC because it is like a mecca of some ways, but it's also about basically a cultural battlefield. You're going to be around some of, of the most experienced devs you meet. Um, and the time that I went to GDC was basically, you never know how like a war starts. Have you ever thought about that? Like, before the war starts. The years that I went to GDC was like the fault lines being exposed. This is the, when Indies versus AAA was hitting its peak of Journey winning, uh, Last of Us. It was the time of this sort of dawning movement of One Reason to Be. Uh, the first One Reason to Be happening in coincidence with the Yeti Zen party, which caused a minor scandal. It was also a time where I got to see a bunch of indie success stories, and they all seemed to really hate their lives. Um, people were talking about the indie apocalypse. Everyone was complaining about clones. This guy gave this talk where basically his success led to his self-destruction. There's a number of different talks from this year. I don't have my notes, but basically like one talk was like how to do in-app purchases without going insane. Uh, talks framed around don't lose your soul in games. Tons of shit like that. It was also hard because I realized that some of the people that I thought were mentors would sometimes say things to their students that weren't always helpful. A mentor that told us when we went with Locanimals, Animals, when we bought our way in with G GDC Play, told us that GDC Play is for people who couldn't make it into the IGF. In some world, that's helpful, understanding what the tiers of a conference are and whatnot. 
at that time, I didn't really know what to make sense of that. And then this happened. Does everyone know what this is? No. Oh my God. <laughs> oh my God. Uh, so please don't, please, when you Google this or search this on YouTube, uh, be very careful about who you try to learn from. But Gamergate was this thing that happened in 2014 and 2015 where all the fault lines that I talked about before basically exploded. And that you could be, you could be a woman or a gay person um, or a marginalized sort of ethnicity in one of these rooms and figure out that everyone in the room didn't want you to be there. It was an explosion that happened in Cross This that also um, basically said that the, uh, the elephant in the room everyone was talking about is more just that the elephant was the room and that game development was an incredibly fraught place to be. Uh, it changed a lot of like how people, at least for me, I started to realize just how toxic the games industry could be. I, when I did an internship at Shell Games, the person next to me, who's a friend, I love him, had this as his background on his desktop in the office. And every day, I would watch his supervisor, who was only a few years older than him and was a woman, would glance at it at the corner of her eye and look uncomfortable. You might not realize this, but there's a question of why is this on a desktop when they're all beautiful ladies, don't get me wrong, but there's a lot of heaving bosoms. Um, and especially when he would just sometimes close a window of what he was working on and just stare at it. There were situations where some of the bravado people brought into games you started to assess. When I disagreed with someone during a meeting, being physically threatened and told to watch my mouth about what I was saying to them and having the tom like the, my voice basically made fun of. There were all the rumors that you started to hear about people in our program and the industry. There's also getting into the back of a car after an LGBT networking event which I had assumed was just an event to like meet friends and talk to people and we were gonna split the Uber back and it was all gonna be fine. And I realized that some of the questions that started coming out were prelude to something else that had nothing to do with what I was capable of as a game designer or a producer. Do you really wanna work in games? How badly do you wanna work in games? So, what will you do for a job? So I wanna say something about this as basically you've all lived through potentially the Me Too movement to recognize that it's not just women I think that suffer under some of these systems, but men can suffer too and often do. I think the worst thing ultimately was a circle of devs being dudes. Um, when I was finishing up at my internship, uh, my, one of my supervisors was just sort of hanging around with a bunch of his friends and just talking to each other and I was trying to go say goodbye and it was the most awkward sensation. Have you ever like walked up to someone and you just sort of felt the click? Like felt the energy that you aren't supposed to be here. You're not supposed to be here. He didn't acknowledge me basically until um, one of my other supervisors was like, oh yeah, this is John's last day. And then he turned around and said, oh, okay, bye. The truth is, is he didn't really owe me much more than that. But it's the overall sensation of being in a place and knowing that in some ways you are not welcome and it's clear that you don't belong. And if you're considering being in the games industry, you should learn about Gamergate because we're still dealing with the fallout from it. And this isn't also isn't just with games. It's a lot of different workplaces and industries. Gamers are just the first people that were honest about it. I learned also that I have to do things or become a person that I didn't want to in order to be accepted. And that everything that had brought me success in previously wasn't working all of the achievement, I wrote a study, I did all of this work, I got all of these good grades, and once I was sort of entering the real world, it didn't really matter. And then the sort of darkest thought, thought happened is that I'll never be able to win at this game if I keep trying to be in games. So, I know you're all young and hopeful, <laughs> but, uh, Basically, I came to this point where I could keep applying to jobs and not get them. I could keep working on look animals, which we didn't get enough investment in when we went to GDC Play, or I could go back to New York and do what I didn't like. I decided to do none of that and moved to Austin <laughs> and entered the reset era, which sounds like a Taylor Swift album. Um, I moved here and basically stopped thinking about trying to become a success in games 
and started just resetting everything. I met my husband and hung out with him. I stayed in touch with everyone from my program. Um, I got a dog and I learned the joy of buying dogs wigs. I kept working on small little projects like board games and whatnot um, and basically just became a different person in some ways, although it's still all the same. Uh, a big moment that came when I was in this phase of my life was my partner broke up with me after two months. Uh, it was devastating and I was very insistent that we get back together so I wrote a short film about a pair of filmmakers making a film about their breakup and I asked him to direct it. I like things that are really meta uh, and we did it and then something strange happened. The film, it's on the internet, I'm not going to tell you where to find it. Uh, <laughs> It, this, the most interesting that happened from it was after we had gone through that process and created something together, we basically talked about it afterwards. And we talked about all the ways that we felt we needed to be a particular version of ourselves for the other person to get that person to like us. It was probably one of the few times I had an honest conversation with someone in my life, which I hope uh, you've all had that before but it was very profound and changed my life and ultimately we ended up back together and are together. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> uh, then I went to a talk by this person. Her name is Norma Jean Maloney and this is completely by chance. Uh, she gave a talk. Uh, she's a Texas sign painter and she basically talked about how she was dealt with the fact that her industry was in decline that she couldn't feel obliged to create what she wanted to create anymore and then found her way out of that. Ultimately what she learned from her process is that everything in sort of life happens for a reason and that the way she learned to sign painting when she was a teenager, she was sitting by the edge of the road painting a sign and then a guy on a bike showed up and said, you're doing that wrong, let me show you how to do this. <laughs> Took the paint out of her hand and then showed her how to paint a sign. She met him decades later, and it turns out that he was a famous sign painter. And she basically told him, like, do you know that you actually changed my life? He didn't, this is great, but she entered this in completely new phase of her life where she took an interest in herself. She says something interesting in one of her talks, which is don't compete, be unique. Which is, I wanna say, after being on GDC, both in your shoes, potentially as a student with a resume and a laptop with a prototype of a game you spent a lot of time on, pushing past other people to get a person from Riot to look at them, that a lot of things in this industry force you to believe that you have to compete with each other versus figuring out what you're good at and being good at that and allowing that to be the reason for your place in the room. It made me realize that the way I was playing this sort of game of being in games, being a creative, was the thing that was actually hurting me. I took an interest in myself again and watched my work improve, and I learned how to smell bullshit, whether it was mine or someone else's. And when I mean that, I mean it's taking accountability for yourself when you're causing the problem versus when knowing to hold someone else accountable. And I also embraced the paradox that vulnerability equals strength. This might not make sense, but eventually someday, some things in these talks might make sense to you if you ever think about it. I'll be honest, it was a pretty dark time of my life. Um, and being real with all the other stuff going on, there are times where just being real about it, like you might wanna not play the game anymore. Ultimately, I didn't do that. And I'm here and I be began to sort of rebuild my foundation. And part of that became realizing as why, what motivates you to actually do any of this? Are you motivated to be a rock star? Do you wanna be standing up on the stage of E3 as a bunch of people shout at you and scream for you and admire your leather jacket? For me, it was different. Um, I thought about the games that really inspired me and the creators who inspired me. And as this dude points to you for having a Zelda e Gods shirt, um, and he said something really interesting. But when I was a child, I went hiking and found a lake. It was quite a surprise for me to stumble upon it. When I traveled around the country without a map, trying to find my way, stumbling on amazing things as I went, I realized how it felt to go on an adventure like this. And that's the, basically the birth of The Legend of Zelda came from that experience. 
It had nothing to do with what he studied in school. It had absolutely nothing to do with uh, the grades he got. It all came from an experience outside of games that he brought into games. I started the talk with this um, presentation, or this GIF, and I think this is so interesting because the Breath of the Wild probably is the best game trailer ever made. And the most replayed moment of that trailer is this, at the two minute 50 mark, where basically despair sets into the story, and then right after this is when the triumphant music comes back in. There's something interesting about this. The top comment on this YouTube video is, sometimes I come back to this trailer just to feel something. Oh, is that cringe? <laughs> no? But I want you to realize that very cringe? No, very sad. It's very sad. I mean, it's very sad about this, but who do you think plays games? Us. Yeah. <laughs> but that's the thing. Like, games, if you, I want, I want to say, games are life made playable. Games are life where the rules make sense, where all of the progression leads to actually something. And the fact is, is that making games has incredible power over people's lives, how they view themselves, and how they care, whether they care about themselves. And ultimately, this something about this game cracked the code in figuring out how to touch people and bring them into the game. You can look at the top comment for Cyberpunk, and it's a very different story compared to this top <laughs> comment. The games are always trying to teach you something. And it might be a lesson that you're ready for, it might be a lesson that you have to revisit. If there's ever a point in your career where you're trying to figure out what to do, I, I did this for myself, which basically helped me figure out why I wanted to make games and create something that was actually real. And it was a conversation between uh, Playboy and Stephen Kubrick, where a pornographer asked a philosopher this question, if life is purposeless, then what is the meaning of uh, living? And then Stanley Kubrick responded with this, that the very meaninglessness of life forces man to create his own meaning. Children, of course, begin life with an untarnished sense of wonder, a capacity to experience total joy at something as simple as the greenness of a leaf. But as they grow older, the awareness of death and decay begins to impinge on their consciousness and subtly erode their joie de vivre, their idealism, and their assumption of immortality. As a child matures, he sees death and pain everywhere around, about him and begins to lose faith in the ultimate goodness of man. But if he is reasonably strong and lucky, he can emerge from this twilight of the soul into a rebirth of life's elan. Both because of and in spite of his awareness of the meaninglessness of life, he can forge a fresh sense of purpose and affirmation. He may not recapture the same pure sense of wonder he was born with, but he can shape something far more en enduring and sustaining. The most terrifying fact about the universe is not that it is hostile, but that it is indifferent. But if we can come to terms with this indifference and accept the challenges of life within the boundaries of death, however mutable man may be able to make them, our existence as a species can have genuine meaning and fulfillment. However vast the darkness, we must supply our own light. Obviously, I was going to therapy during all of this. And my therapist told me something interesting, that there can be a kind of joy in discovering oneself to be alive in one's own very particular way. Where I basically decided, after seeing everything that was happening in games, all the assholes, all the sexism, all the threats, all the weird come-ons, uh, that I would try again. And so if there's any advice in this, when I started New Game Plus, take note of what makes you feel something. I basically decided to make vessels because I was still stuck on that idea of someone being trapped in an airlock and having to sort of barter their way to freedom. When I made the game, um, we created sort of a holy trinity of character archetypes in order to interact with. And I wanted to place people in these really ambiguous situations where you would have to basically control someone, remove their autonomy, and wear them as a mask to basically ensure your own survival. Ultimately, you choosing yourself over everyone else on the ship. You have no memories. You don't know anything about them. But then as you keep playing the game, 
um, this visions that you see, the voices that you hear in your head, keep asking you to do worse and worse things. And by the end of Act 3, they're asking you to start killing people on the ship in order, of course, to save yourself. I, a lot of these feelings meant something to me, and that's why I wanted to put them into the game. When you're figuring out exactly what you want to do with your life, you need to figure out your loops and then break them. We live basically in a society where your phones are engineered to take over everything about you and control what you see and what you do. I spent a good part of my life when I was in game development, addicted to League of Legends, until, sorry, that's, that's cringe. Um, <laughs> um, and then I talked to a MOBA designer, and then he had a realization that he shared with me. He was like, it needed to feel bad. The only way to get people to play that game is if they feel bad. Does anyone play League of Legends in here? Yeah! <laughs> Don't do it. <laughs> so part of that, when I talk about figuring out the loops, is thinking out who you thought I, want, I needed to be, but also on some level who I wanted to be. But then also figure out who you actually am and enjoy being. And on the right side, this is who I am as like a leader in a game dev. It's Kermit in a Bayonetta costume with <laughs> rocket launchers attached to my feet. <laughs> and I have no interest in being Ken Levine. There's a pretty good... You could have just read this tweet and you'll get the summation of what this talk has been about. But be a Kermit the Frog, have a creative vision and no ego. Recognize the unique talents of those around you, attract weirdos, manage chaos, show kindness, and be sincere. The adventure of game development, it doesn't matter if you work in game development or any of this, but the adventure is finding out who people are beneath their masks. For this character, her name is Peyton. She's the alcoholic pilot, the sort of blue collar person on the ship. She fulfills a very particular trope, like Starbuck, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I was on an airplane and I met a woman. And have you ever had this feeling like someone wants to talk to you? Like you're just sort of like doing your own thing and then you can feel like this pressure from someone else or whatnot? That's what it was like being on that airplane next to this woman, where I was in the middle seat just playing on the switch and feeling this energy that she wanted to talk to me. Once she finally did talk to me, she basically told me that she was flying back home to spend some time with her mother because her father had just died. I was like, oh, okay. Um, and we were talking about that, and she talked about how her father had a drinking problem and he chose another way out. She didn't really need to say more after that point, but it was such so interesting that we were both seated next to each other and then had this conversation where she decided to tell this to me. And basically that woman inspired this character where Peyton is dealing with alcoholism. She's basically trying to get her life back on track. By the end of the third act, probably the worst thing that happens in the game beyond the murder is this sequence where you need basically access to Peyton in order to pass a biometric lock so you can access the cockpit. And she's not coming to talk to you. And she's trying to be good about her life. She's trying to stop drinking. And you get to invite her to start drinking again. And part of the, this game is, obviously sounds sociopathic. My friend basically played this game, I feel like a sociopath, is to reverse engineer empathy. From the sense of, you're doing this for yourself, but you're also doing these things to people for yourself. Does it feel good? Um, so yeah, she's an interesting character. Make games for yourself, your team, and the world around you. This is the dev team behind Vessels. There are six of us. When I showed you those games at the beginning that we were competing against, those games had like 16 people on them. They had like 12 people on them. This is basically our team when we made this game. And all of them are in the game. And that's something that I try to do as a developer. And all of them, in some ways, are sort of influenced in the sort of five main characters that we have. There's Caleb, this dude, <laughs> uh, who basically gets to play the best character. You get to meet this character who, who's dead throughout most of the game, but you get to meet him in the true ending because I thought this is the reward is getting to meet Caleb. Uh, and then there's this guy. His name's Alex. And when I talk to Alex, and maybe you'll meet him, he works at another uh, studio in Austin now. Um, he doesn't think he's good at anything. 
He's the only reason the game got made, but his main skill and purpose on the team was really just motivating all of us, and we allowed him to put parts of himself in the game. There's these cheesy motivational posters strewn throughout the ship, and what's strange about it is, is that they're all on theme for what the game is about. It's also great because once you start making games and putting out in the world, all of your super emo shit, people are gonna screen cap it and share it. So when I wrote this line at like 3 a.m. because I was feeling some kind of way, someone put this on our community hub and I was like, holy shit, I forgot I wrote that. <laughs> Ultimately, the last piece of advice I have is to play the game together. There's been this sort of running sub-theme throughout this and just talking to my friend Danny, I showed her this talk that once you enter the marketplace, once you work in games, you're going to feel this intense urge that you're going to have to compete with everyone. You're going to compare yourself to your careers and whatnot. And my hopeful advice is that you don't do that and only just compare yourself to yourself and recognize that all the people that I basically work with, I'm still working with them now. Like Eric and I are making in a game together. Uh, Christian here on the right is working on a game with us. It's going to happen for us. And that's because a lot of the relationships that you're making now, whether it's in games or in any career, wherever you choose in life, it's going to happen. There's also a lot of people available to you right now within your community. Some here right at UT. Sarah and Chip were two of the advisors on Vessels. Chip is probably one of the most experienced game designers around. So if you want to learn some from someone who worked on the new Tomb Raider series and some of the Metroid Primes, he's there. Um, Sarah basically shook me every day to just chill the fuck out. Uh, Justin and John are here in the audience. Justin also played a motivational role. He's like, and um, Bill's another instructor that's here at UT. And then Susan runs a thing called the Narrative Department uh, here in Austin, which is a community, if you're interested in narrative at all, of narrative designers. And she's worked on Bioshock, Gears of War. Like her AAA resume is extensive. So after all of that, all of that cringe, all those emotions, ultimately with all the time that you have ahead of you, the hours, what game do you want to play? And I'm done. <laughs>